Okay, uh, welcome. Kia ora um, to the August meeting of the um, Community Strategy Committee. Um, we've got a few around the table today, which is good to see, and we're starting to get back into some normality, so, or what the new normal is. Uh, I do have one apology here from uh, Councillor Bolger. Is there any other apologies on the floor? I'll just have someone to move that those apologies are accepted. Uh, Councillor Dixon and seconded uh, His Worship, uh, Mayor Hicks. All those in favour? Thank you. OK, we've got a um, reasonably interesting agenda this afternoon with a number of different reports and uh, some of them are obviously updates and continuation of some of our good projects that are happening around, around town um, and around the community. Um, and uh, along with some to make some decisions around on where we're, where we're going to. So um, first item on the agenda today is obviously Gemma uh, down, the, down the back there. If she wants to if you come up, Gemma, you can use one of the microphones so that I'm sure Nick will show you how it works. So. Um, Gemma's, uh, yeah, if, well, I'll get, um, get the community strategy manager to uh, obviously Active Southland and their annual report. Okay, so the purpose of the report that's in front of you is the year ending 30th of June 2022, because you'll remember the council has a contract for service through to June 2024 with Active Southland, and it's $30,000 per annum. And so Gemma's here to give us an overview of all the work they've been doing in the district. Um, hi everybody, nice to see you all again. Um, my name's Gemma O'Neill, I'm the Eastern Active Coordinator for Active Southland. Um, maybe a few faces I haven't seen since we've um, rebranded, so you may know us previously as Sport Southland. Uh, just a year gone by now where we've been Active Southland, which um, was based around being a better representation of the work we do um, throughout the community. Not that sport's not important to us, it very much still is, but it just encompassed more of our uh, initiatives. Um, Thank you for having me today. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to apologise on behalf of Jess Dormigan, our um, current interim CE. Um, she couldn't be here today. Um, but thank you again from her for allowing us to come and have a chat and our continued work we do together in the community um, between Active Southland and the Gore District Council, um, which we are hugely appreciative of. Um, as you can see from the length of the report, sorry about the reading content there, people, um, we. Um, it's not just um, myself and my role that uh, works into the Gore and Eastern region. We have a huge contribution um, from all of our teams that we have, um, m most of the rest of them based out of our Invercargill office, but um, it's, a, it's an organisation-wide contribution to what happens out here uh, across our different teams, our different contract areas. And so this report is, is highlighting that, that mahi that um, comes our way. Um, we're very proud to be able to represent uh, and do work for the Eastern Southland community. Um, and we hope to uh, carry on with all this long into the future. Um, 20 odd pages of uh, stuff, as I said to the team when we, we, we submitted this last week, it's, it's work that's not to be sniffed at. We've done an amazing amount for our community across a wide scope from health to sports to schools um, and just about everything in between. And um, yeah, we've really enjoyed it. And our highlights include um, things like our GORAS uh, promotion we've done in conjunction with uh, stakeholders with you guys through um, the Parks and Recreation team helping promote local open spaces, activating sites. Um, but we, we're trying to carry on in that space and being as reactive to our community as we can in terms of what we're doing on the ground out here as well. So where we can, we take on um, as much insight and information from our community members in terms of planning what our next steps are. So, for example, the GORAS project commented on in here, uh, our next iteration will come in the next set of school holidays based off feedback we got from the last lot. So over 100 respondents came through for the activation we did uh, in the green space of the town bout here in the April school holidays. Um, so we've taken on board that the people were looking for free, family-friendly activities that they could do in their own time, um, at their own pace. Um, you know, learning about new places and seeing new things. So um, that's what we intend to carry on with in the October school holidays. We do also intend to move that out more regionally, regionally in Easton, even though we've used the hashtag GORAS. Um, 
we will continue using that. We've had a lot of feedback that that's become a recognisable thing locally, but we do intend to take things to these smaller communities and, and using the same process of talking with the locals as we go and planning things that suit them, what they want, how they want it, where they want it, when they want it, that kind of activity. So that's sort of us in a nutshell. Um, if there's any questions from the report, please don't hesitate to um, sing out. Um, and same with down the line, if anyone's got anything they want to discuss as we carry on um, through the year, please, we're always got an open door down there at the stadium, so um, always keep in touch. Yes, no, um, thank you, Gemma. Um, probably one of the comments, if, if you actually address what, I've, what I was gonna say right at the start there, that there has been a lot of activity there and there's a lot of information and a lot of um, a lot of input going across the community um, and probably one of the questions I'd probably have is just in regard to the change since we've we've obviously had an interesting couple of years with the younger and the youth and school um, are we noticing that across some of the activities and, and people coming into them or um, whether there has been a change in attitude and, and definitely that sort of thing? yep um, we're getting a lot of feedback through schools, through sports, um, through community groups, through social services around the fact that people were, um, they either broke a habit that they might have been into and, and going back to whatever they're doing was hard or the options available for them to go back to post COVID was um, restricted or changed and not what they might have been looking for. So one of the things we try to do in that insights and locally led approaches around working with those provision groups around creating opportunities that are, are um, based solely off what, what people want, taking on board their participant view and, and putting that forward in, in what they promote to the community or what they have on offer. So that's something we continue working on. Um, this day and age, the old cookie cutter, we've always done it that way approach doesn't fit, especially in the youth, in the rangatahi teenage space anymore. And so trying to work on ways to have opportunities for people to participate in a way that suits them um, is where we're, where we're really focusing on, with, especially with that age group at the moment. Okay, no, thanks for that. Um, I open it up to the councillors. Uh, question, okay. Nick. Yeah, just want to say, yeah, thanks for the great report. It was a good read. Um, yeah, you've certainly made a lot of key um, relationships with um, a lot of the schools and everything. And it's quite neat driving past the schools and see everyone out activating and, and all that. Um, probably from my point of view, the only thing that I would probably may be put more emphasis on is, is, is how our tennis clubs. Mm -hmm. Can we get more people joining up to them? This sort of, yeah, is, is my next step in the future. So. Cool. Yeah, but other than that, yeah, great report. It was a good read. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor McPhail. Um, yeah, it's a good report, Gemma, and uh, obviously you've been all working very, very hard. Um, I just wondered, are there any outstanding issues with the youth in the area, that the facilities that they may need, and um, what would you see as an area overall that you'd like to see, so uh, where you'd like to be working and putting some um, resources into? I think in that rangatahi space, in that teenage age space, a lot of it's not necessarily around facilities, but around participation structures. Um, mm. Struggling to get, um, for various reasons, a lot of barriers in, in way, but trying to get people to commit to the original We'll have this many weeks, it'll cost you this much, you'll do this many games, it'll be this, that, as we've always been. It's just, it's really getting hard for Fano to commit to these days. And if we can work with those providers, whether it be the facility or the, the activity itself, around making sure that um, those pr um, participation structures are more aligned to what the user is looking for, then naturally that should increase uh, participation in those groups. So whether that's a sport, for us there's sort of the three avenues, sport, active rec and play, they're across all of the age groups, so we're trying to work in those three areas with local groups around what that might look like going forward. You would have seen mentioned in the report of our Tumanua Active Aotearoa Fund, so we have um, funds available that we administer on behalf of Sport NZ for eligible groups to apply for, and it's, it's, it's have a go money. It's, it's um, a, a, in a way for people to give these things a go without having a risk attached to, yeah, so if anything comes from that, whatever learning's good, bad or otherwise, um, it's that they can obviously get involved in that, give it a go, and learn from it one way or the other. <laughs> I think particularly that rangatahi space is, is quite big for us. We've had done a lot of work uh, individually with, recently myself, Menzies, St. Peter's, and Gore High. So working in with those kids and, and 
and, and that's, I think, nailed it there, working with the children. Yes, you've got to bring the adults along on the journey, but working with those children, that's particularly what we'll go forward with in, in the future. It, one of the things we'll go forward with in the future, that's a priority. Yep. They are the group that are um, increasingly dropping out of sport and recreation yeah. in that age space. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really important. It's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Glynis. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, yes, a great report that you have, Gemma. And my question is, I know that a lot of young people are really into technology at the moment. So how do you combine technology maybe with getting children active? Is there a secret to that? Or oh, that's, that's one we're yet to crack, I think. And I think it's not, it's not just our organisation. That's across the board. The, the technology world cannot be um, excluded anymore. We can't look at it as a negative. We've got to use it for its positives, and whether that fits into play, active recreation, or sport, as I said, we've got to all learn to work together to, for us to learn more about it, and then work with those youth around how we can apply it in those settings to make it a more positive experience, and use, use it as a benefit, not as a barrier. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? From one? Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, it's not actually a question, but... Further to Councillor Dixon's comment, um, excuse me, um, I know that one of the groups locally, and you probably know them too, that do a lot of that online gaming mm -hmm. stuff, they actually have a sport component where they break down and then they have a, an active part to it. Is that somewhere you see that um, it might be an opportunity to do the same sort of thing? Absolutely. It's one of those things where, like I said, we have to go. We have to roll with these things. If that's mm, part that, of what the youth yeah. are looking for to get them active, whatever way that looks like, we have to we have to be able to be um, react to that scenario and go forward with it. And if we can combine them and it mm. brings more people on board, whatever it needs to do, we'll make we'll we'll do our best to make sure that that's an mm. appropriate way to go with these guys. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple of comments, uh, Gemma. Look, Thank you very much for the work that you're doing here. And you know, Active Southland often flies beneath the radar, and, and it's not until you see it in written form here you realise just the the um, length and breadth of, of the activity that you have here, and it's fantastic. So so well done. Just in terms of what's happening at East School School and the Active Schools program, mm -hmm. um, so I get, my understanding is the next step is getting more funding. Is that right? Yep. So yep. can we do anything to help that? I mean, don't ask us for money, but <laughs> can we help you ask other people for money? Yeah, as you guys have been an integral stakeholder into that process with the um, neighbourhood play system in eScore, and so mm. ha absolutely anything you guys can and can contribute, contribute from a uh, putting us onto the right people, backing what we're going, what the guys are going forward for, for whether it be through Wendy at the school or through the team internally, um, we'll of course um, gratefully take that on board. So um, that is the current. Um, status they're looking for funders to come on board and any way we can remove any barriers to get those projects moving forward is, is going to be warmly welcomed. Mm. So I guess the connection uh, from you guys to us is through Keith is it? Yes currently yeah. yep. Okay thanks. No well done. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Uh, if we just have one, uh, someone move that that report is received. Uh, Councillor Reid and seconded uh, uh, Councillor Phillips. All those in favour? Thank you, Gemma. And Thank you. Keep up the good work. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, our uh, second matter on the agenda is with our Ready for Living coordinator. Kylie's here, so um, quite topical, really, because we've. Um, just about weekly around the countryside, various issues happening in the emergency management, yeah. and uh, also topical because we've had Environment South here a couple of weeks ago telling us that we've got some issues with our flood banks. So, um, yeah, we'll leave it in your hands to brief us. So, in our original action plan for the two years, 2021 to 23, um, we decided that emergency management would be something that needs looked at for the older community. Um, and exactly it, like seeing the floods in the last few weeks, West Coast being hit three times, four times now are we? Whatever we're up to, um, just being aware 
that these things are happening more frequent and the Alpine Vault is also um, predicted to go in the next wee while. So um, it's science. <laughs> so it's just about being prepared. So lots of older people I talk to aren't prepared. Um, haven't got water, rely on electricity, which is probably likely to be cut off with a storm, earthquake and flooding are our three main ones in Gore. So we've worked with, emerge, I've been working with Emergency Management Southland along that, um, the importance of heating or something to heat, either heat your home or heat your food if there's no power, um, lots of people without fires and things. So talking to older people about those things. And, and the new reliance on carers, cleaners and Meals on Wheels. So older people are being encouraged to stay in their homes longer, um, which is, I guess, causing a different issue for emergency management. If they're in their homes and need a carer coming in six times a day, I think there's some people getting it that many times a day. Have you had your meds? Have you eaten? Have you to shower and um, food? Yeah, so they'd rather do that than rest home. So it's a new, a new way of thinking and we're just working through that and met with the DHB older persons manager um, last week. So we are, but that's the way the system's moving to, um, so about emergency management for these people is gonna be quite critical and not relying on meals on wheels potentially not getting to these people, so having options of, well, having them prepared as well. Um, medication and repeats and things like that uh, came up as important. Just skimming through. So this morning, very conveniently, this is our draft guide. Sonia hasn't even seen it. I haven't been at work today. But it will look maybe something like this. Um, a booklet specifically designed for older people to start thinking about preparedness. Um, covering things like um, medications, having them on board, what you need in your getaway packs and in your home. Medications, pets reminding, because that was one of the things a lot of older people couldn't take pets with them. So um, that's came up as a section as well. So it's just hopefully all included. We're trying to cut it down, but yeah, we'll <laughs> review it. So there's the booklet, hoping to do some first aid courses for older people, so just getting them underway. So that won't be a qualification, it will just be sitting there learning about the pre-hospital type of mission or anything that might relate to them in just like a two, three hour block. Um, and I've talked to a few older people and they said, well, I won't be able to do CPR. And I was like, it would be good if you came and learnt how to talk someone else through it um, and things like that. So it's a different aspect to looking at how older people can do first aid. So hopefully we'll have our first course before Christmas and depending how we go, a couple next year. Um, Emergency Management Southland's going to be speaking to some different groups, older people groups, on being prepared in the hazards. And then hopefully I'm going to do a campaign leading up to Christmas um, for the hard to buy for people on getting them emergency management preparedness gear from water to maybe a gas cooker. Um, I bought my grandma one um, already to <laughs> have at her house um, just to be prepared. So just a different um, campaign, I guess, to work on. And as well as that, they have clued up kids for um, younger people. So Clued Up Kids has fire, ambulance, police, all the services um, there to talk to younger people. So we're looking to um, doing something around that for seniors that fit more into um, that also. And then we'll be visiting rest homes and just um, working with them on plans. Have we covered everything? <laughs> Um, thanks, Kylie. I do say there'll be a few questions here. Just um, from, from uh, a query in regard to, obviously, it is 
within the health service and, and older aged people now, they are leaving them in the, at home and trying to provide services there. Those lists of those people that are getting those services, that obviously incorporated in here somewhere so that if we do shut the town down for a period of days that we actually get them sent to us and part of that emergency management response. Yep. Um, because there's different, as you say, some can have can have three to four to five visits a day and some are every couple of days. So yep. um, that obviously forms part of that basis. Yeah, we have talked about as well as having it on the ground, doing something at the, what's the operation centre? Yeah, EOC, EOC centre yeah. at that level as well, having some paperwork in there and how we're going to link in yeah. with those healthcare DHB workers to get that information at that time. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah there is that aspect. Um, and working with medical centres as well. Because it, it, it's a double-sided issue with the fact that you've got the, the not only them, they become isolated, it's also the workers that are coming in yeah. are obviously have the situational confusion or the, the change in what's going on and can't service them. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and the other one's obviously the gas cookers. Well, most town families have got gas cookers in their garages and they're called barbecues, so. But lots of uh, older people don't have barbecues, I know, but, yeah. Their but their neighbours may have them, or yeah, yeah. <laughs> someone could have that, yeah. so. The neighbourhood stuff as probably well. Probably part of the support network, yeah. so. But um, no, uh, interesting, and it, and it is very topical. Um, we're seeing things just about every week now, mm -hmm. where um, whether it's slips, floods, winds, um, you name it, it's there, so. Uh, I'll open it up to the floor, for, um, Bronwyn. Yes, thank you. Um, it's. It is topical and I think it's really important and the one thing that the seniors in our area, I presume they're like that throughout the country, they're used to being very independent and they try hard to keep that independence there. But I also know that when there's been issues and they've had to ring for the ambulance, things like that, it's quite often after the event and, um, and I think maybe in part of that booklet or part of those community meetings and things that you're going to have, we need to reassure them that it's actually okay to actually ask for help, um, and whether that be through their emergency buttons or picking up the phone. And do they have something like a one one call on as an emergency on their phones as well? I don't know, yeah. but I just think that's the reassurance for them. Yeah. No, you're not putting us out. Please ring. You're putting us to more trouble if you don't. Um, yeah. We did have that in one of the first versions. I can't remember if it's in this version. <laughs> um, but yeah, the older people seem to, there's people that need more help than me, but actually they're going down. But there is a big, going to be a bit of work done by DHB, I believe, on the um, pre-hospital admission, how they can help with mm. that stuff to reduce hospital admissions. It's, it's, it's really good to see that this is all being put in place. I think it's quite reassuring. So, yeah, great. Venus. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, Good overview, Kylie. I'm just wondering, um, you were doing computer courses for older people, which could be quite important for them as well at this time. Do you, are you going to continue with those? or um, REAP still got the contracts, so they're doing a couple more now. And I believe the library had the contract as well, but it never really started, so in the new building it might be something something we can yeah. talk about again. And I also think that Neighbourhood Watch could play a big yep. part in this, just yep, to keep so an eye on... They've got their own wee section. On, in yep, the yep, so I've been looking in with Kelly <coughs> and we can work together on that. Yep. Yes, great. I agree with what Bronwyn's saying too. They, um, they do, elderly people do like to be independent. I know I run a few people during COVID and they're saying, well, you didn't bother about older people before, why are you ringing us now, sort of thing. So... I think um, it is important that we keep their independence, but also encourage them to seek help when needed. Yeah. Tracy, Kylie, just a, a quick question. Have you got any sense of the numbers of people that are getting multiple visits per day by, by nurses or mm -hmm. medical staff? No. 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 Uh, I think, Tracy, we could actually get that information if we, if we wanted it. When I met with um, Sharon Adler on Friday, we talked about data and what was available. So I think over the next wee while, we'll be collating some of that to get a better perspective. Um, 
but one of the big challenges with that in Gore at the moment is lack of staff to actually service and talking with Sharon, like almost on a daily basis, families are getting phone calls to say, you know, we can't, our care can't come because of sickness and you know the same issues that are happening in businesses. And it's fine if you have some family in Gore, but it's not fine for those people that don't. And there is um, significant numbers that don't have family here. So there's a whole raft of issues in that space and we just need to quietly keep working through it. Um, and I guess with the locality network starting to get established, some of those things are going to be up for discussion in how we go forward. But we have Sharon actually coming to go for International Older Person Day as a speaker and her and Carl will be speaking. So um, that's going to be a real opportunity to, I guess, socialise some conversation with older people around a raft of issues that we'll work on into the future. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Um, and I, yeah, I think it just you raise a whole lot of good points there. But in terms of getting a sense of the, the number of people we're dealing with here, it would be really helpful as we're doing our civil defence planning um, going forward. Um, and also, you mentioned the localities network, and I think that's that's a pretty important. Um, change in strategy for, for any community and it's going to be particularly so for ours and, and I think as a, a community strategy committee it would be really good to get someone and someone like Stuart Barson who's right in the, the middle of that to come and present to the community strategy committee at, at some point in time. No, some um, good points there Tracy, thank you. Um, Bronwyn? Sorry, just another query. I feel like we're probably thinking more of the residents in town, by presuming that Matara and Waikaka residents will be included in all of this. And also in those, on the periphery of those towns too, there's a lot of people who are still in their own homes, but out of town and not connected as much. So there may be need more work needed to integrate them into all of those different parts of that program. Yeah. So um, just on that note with neighbourhood support, We've been having some discussions about uh, a piece of work that we would do in our rural communities and how we connect with them because they're quite key and in other, in most other parts of the country, neighbourhood support is a function within council and in our case it isn't. So it's actually really important that we work really closely with them and police. So we have, are in the middle of some discussions and we will be having some conversations with the older person of our community, I guess, and we've definitely got rural on the on the radar there. And I know when you talk to the two care agents, sees that they certainly can give us the numbers in, in our rural spaces that they're going to on a daily basis. Yeah. Okay, any further questions or discussion? Right, thanks, Kylie. That's obviously... Uh, a good update and obviously proceeding in a good direction, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, that um, it hits the ground and hopefully it doesn't have to be put into f action too soon. So, But um, as you say, it's sort of not if but when. So, um, If I just have someone move to receive that, uh, Councillor Reid and second uh, Councillor Dixon, uh, all those in favour? Thank you. Uh, move on to our second item, which is being presented by Kylie again in relation to the review of the 80s years and over parking permits. So if you'd like to give us a rundown on that, see how we're doing. Implemented the 80 plus parking permit in October last year. Um, 202 people have received the parking permit, um, providing metre spaces um, free parking in the metered spaces for older members of the community. Um, mm. We had amazing feedback from all the over 80s. Um, Emma receiving a handwritten letter by one older lady um, thanking us so much for it and how much she appreciated it. No need for the coins, how marvellous it was. Um, and no fret if you can caught in a shop too long, marvellous. We got two marvellous um, 
So I did a random survey of 17 older people that have the permit um, and had all positive responses from them. Um, on average, 10 older people use the permit two or more times a week. Three used it weekly, three used it fortnightly, and one used it not very often. Um, the gentleman that only goes to the supermarket, he told me. 100% were grateful and appreciated the free parking and found it useful. Um, some comments that came up. Um, it's out of this world amazing, we love it. It's, we're very grateful for free parking. Um, it's really good, very generous of the council. Free parking is wonderful, very good. It's very nice for us to have it. Really great, convenient, um, I'm not a good walker. Came up quite a few times around them, um, stating older people stating that. Um, the process of applying for the parking permit was easy. Um, everyone said and couldn't suggest any changes to that process. Um, they found it useful because of poor balance or couldn't stand for long periods of time. So just being able to get out of their car and go to the shops. Um, the lack of change in society now. Um, but quite a, quite a few were quick to say, it's not that I can't afford it type worry that we're <laughs> judging as we're saying it. Um, um, convenient. Well, they're some that were more able had parked in New World or non-metered parks and they enjoyed being able to park closer to the shops. Um, and that they weren't as restricted as much of how many coins they had. And yeah, they didn't see any changes needed in that. Um, when asked what else could council do for you, um, <laughs> wasn't quite worded like that, but um, um, one suggested that the parking could, um, if it could be reciprocal with Invercargill's free over 18, 80 parking, um, and they found the parking meter attendant helpful when um, applying for permits on the street, I oh, know. Um, so most didn't have any other things for council to do. Um, I had, we need to be thankful for what we have, don't molly coddle older people, Make it, um, keep making them carry on. Um, free dump charges came up, better footpaths, remove planters on Oak Street, you'll be a few happy at the moment, for <laughs> and lower rates of course. Um, and some people originally suggested um, lowering the age to 65 or 70 for free parking, but we feel so um, the 80 <laughs> is a good age to keep it at. Um, and the revenue lost um, is hard to de determine with COVID and other factors in the last 10 months, I think. Oh no, it was, yeah. Um, so there was a change there from 71 to 52, but um, I guess other things could have affected that as well as less parks on Oak Street and um, different things as well. So. Okay, um, thanks Kylie for the update. Uh, there's obviously a couple of things in there, I'm not sure about the lower rates, I think there's probably people <laughs> un under 80s would like that as well. So, and I think we have got rid of the plants on Eric Street now, so <laughs> we've got a couple of wins there. Um, but yeah, uh, in regard to that Invercargill, the reciprocal <coughs> agreement, so we will, where, did, where can we go with that? Um, Is there anything we can work on? I am essentially, um, Communicate okay. with them and ask once I guess new councils in it will be something. To, um, because we would off, offer it back the other way for the, all the Invercargill shoppers coming to Gore, so yeah, um, <laughs> encourage them to come up. So I think that would be something to pursue. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I think we, you look at the commentary here; it was a good, a good move to get it through, and um, we've done well. So, but I'll open it up to the floor for questions or commentary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there's no real discussion in my view about this. I think it's a great initiative and we should keep keep on doing this. The 80-year-olds are very pleased with it. Uh, uh, 
Bronwyn. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm happy to remove uh, to remove to move the report. Um, it's a good report, and it's nice to think that we're actually doing something positive and mm. getting a plus, a bit yeah. of tick. Thanks, Kai. Um, someone would like to second that or firm, further commentary or second? Uh, Councillor Grant, all those in favour? Uh, carried. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Kylie, for the effort. Interesting times. And uh, yeah, keep up the good work. Okay. Uh, we move on to item four, um, closing the gaps. And I see we have Mark here. Welcome, Mark. It's good to see you. Um, and I'll let you have the floor along with um, Anne. Who wants to start, or do you guys want to start? So, um, obviously, our report to June. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. Um, so, the report submitted gives you an overview of the work carried out by Closing the Gap scheme um, in the last financial year to the 30th of June. Um, so we've had yet another really successful year with Closing the Gaps. Um, we are provided with funding to support 50 placements in the local district, and we managed to fund 51 placements. And we also supported, supported a further 10 placements. Um, of those 51, 27, which is a very large number, were actually supportive of apprenticeships in the area um, from 24 different companies and five, of the, uh, five more are actually pending registration as well, so that's a, a really large number. Um, we do have a small number of people leaving their positions, unfortunately, but that's understandable in such a, an employee bias market at the moment. Um, and what we do as part of our pastoral care process is um, talk to those employees to determine why they're leaving, how we can support the business moving forward, and possibly support those employees as well to find further work. Um, so we have enabled local businesses to support youth um, to uh, provide training, to uh, purchase equipment such as tools, etc. And that's facilitated the retention of NEETs in the area as a result. Um, we've been able to reinforce and establish connections with the local business um, and commun uh, business community and a lot of goodwill has been created as a result. So much so that now we have so many of our referrals happening through the sharing of the scheme with other businesses by those that are already involved. Um, we have a Closing the Gaps website, which as of yesterday um, was advertising 78 positions in the uh, Gore District, so still quite a large number. Um, we disseminate information to uh, 64 members um, on a Gore um, Business Network Facebook page, make them aware of opportunities and events that are coming up. And we also use that as a platform to um, share information about things like uh, um, Immigration New Zealand criteria, such as the accredited employer work visa um, that was launched recently. And we also um, provide information during lockdown periods about COVID restrictions, possible MSD supports as well. Um, something else that we make businesses aware of, which supports apprentices locally, is apprenticeship boosts, which they can use to subsidise wages, in addition to closing the gaps funding. So it's um, something well worth pursuing. Moving forward this year, um, completion of the Gore District Business Survey 2022, which we'll hear more about later on, um, has gained information that will inform a new Gore District workforce plan um, including needs of businesses and insights into the current business climate within the Gore District. Um, the, the focus will prioritise engagement with the food and fibre sector, particularly farmers, who we're really striving to engage more and more with. Working more closely with local high schools and Great South in the future to establish how we can work together to more effectively deliver outcomes for youth once they leave school. So we were asked... Um, at the beginning of the year to provide numbers of NEETs, which is basically um, youth that are not in employment, education or training. And we were asked by Great South to um, provide numbers around those um, people, but we weren't able to do so. It's a very hard thing to do because 
high schools no longer have a mandate to work with those students once they leave school necessarily, unless they, and unless they come under other service providers, it's very hard to track down those um, people that lie outside those services. But in working with the high schools more closely, we can get a better gauge of that. We can um, support their transition into the workplace from school. Um, we can also look at supporting students at high school to gain their driver's license before they leave school so that they can hit the ground running um, with at least their restricted license when they leave school and in, improve their employability. And work is currently being carried out to explore if there is a need to support local apprentices providing a venue to network and work on assignments in addition to the support that the ITOs already provide like BCITO in the building sector. Um, we feel that there's real um, potential in this to support those apprentices so they can come together over pizza, share ideas, and that be supported by I visiting ITOs as well. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add there, Anne? Um, probably I'd just add that as of today, our chief executive signed the contract for the next round. Um, as some changes in, um, I guess, if the criteria is broadened, which will actually help us because we've had people that have been coming to us that weren't within the criteria uh, last year. So that's a real positive, and we pushed quite hard to get that criteria changed. Um, so our next step for this year is to get our employability uh, person on board in a fixed term contract. So you'll see that happen in the next few weeks. Um, yeah, so that, that's sort of where we're at with the, with the going forward, but we were actually really pleased with how the end result for the year, yeah. I suppose the other probably thing that we should comment on is we've had really good partnerships throughout um, Southland. So two years ago that wasn't the case, and we've worked really hard with the likes of the Hokanui Hunui, Hokanui Rananga, the uh, Great South, MSD. So there's some really good partnerships and we've just partnered with uh, Workbridge in the last couple of months and had a session with farmers and we had all of the agencies in the room and there were some really amazing outcomes from a workforce perspective. So we intend to do that again with some other sectors. Um, so the agricultural sector was actually one of the hard ones for us to tap into but we're actually starting to make some nice inroads in there and being able to find the gems uh, where we can actually help. So yeah, that's sort of where we're at for going forward. Um, thanks, Anne, and thanks, Mark. Um, good to see you here in person, I'll say that again, because it is good to see your smiling face. <laughs> and uh, also the fact that that work is, you know, fruition, um, it's coming to fruition and there is particularly those positions, I know it's one of those things that, um, you know, we don't go waving the banner too much and we actually see it at, see it at the end of the day, seeing those results coming through. Um, just a query in regard to the job seeker uh, allowances and that, what, where are we sitting now? Like, the, what's the stats with Gore numbers wise? I know we used to sit about 400 and something. Or, it's it's less than that. It's 3.4%, yeah. I believe, yeah. so about 300 and they were there about, yeah, yeah, 340. So. Probably the other thing I should just mention is that the difference going into this year is that we will be able to give up to $6,000 to a business, but three is tagged at a wages level and three is um, an employability level. Okay. And then there is some flexibility around the pastoral care and other training. So uh, it's... It's going to be a little bit more tricky, but um, I think we can work with it and get some good outcomes for our businesses and yeah. our young people. No. Thanks, Anne. And uh, before I open it up, obviously there's, a, there's quite a connect between this and the next business survey and, and that, uh, yes. those good inroads that are coming with the private, primary sector because you know, everyone's looking for staff and Absolutely. You know, we, we are getting those connections. So I'll open it up to the uh, floor for discussion or commentary. Uh, Gwyneth. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, just reading through the business sector and seeing that um, 
what is keeping young people back from going into farming? And one of the things is the long hours, isolation. There's a whole lot of things there. Yes. How do we change that perception of, of um, farming for young people? Because it's important. I know farmers are lacking in staff and skilled staff. Or if we haven't Absolutely. got young people coming on, it's mm -hmm. going to be difficult. I think that comes under some work that Great South would be looking to do in terms of educating students within high schools um, and you know, um, changing those perceptions, hopefully, so that they can go and um, explore um, as, as a career path, um, actual placements through poss uh, possibly Gateway. Um, but yeah, they need that education first. So um, at the meeting that we had with the farming community and the agencies, uh, there is a body now that actually is taking young people. So at that event, what was really good is there was a, quite a number of students that were into the agricultural sector, uh, and there is cl there is more defined pathways. Mm. So it's it's working with the schools and the young people to to identify what people are interested in and putting the ideas in front of them. But I think the interesting piece of work that we did there was when you go out into a district and you start talking to the farmers and the farming community, there's a lot of farmers that do not actually employ people anymore. And that became really evident when we were trying to define who those people are and in talking to different farmers to say, well, who do you know that's out there that employs? And so it's the contract community that are doing the work on farms. And so it's trying to find the pathways into those spaces. And they can be more difficult because we have a massive driver's license issue. And to, so you need to have a full license before you can progress to the other licenses that are required in those businesses. So um, it's about breaking it down and then working on solutions for the different pieces of the industry. Yeah. Do you feel that that's something that REIT could be involved in, is getting people to that stage where they can get their heavy traffic licence? So um, you'll be aware that, I think it was in the budget round, the government has put a significant amount of money which is coming through from MSD as the agency, and in discussions with MSD uh, in the last two weeks, they're still trying to work out how that will get delivered on the ground, and we've certainly put a hand up. We'd have already been in discussions with MPI and um, REAP, because we see REAP as the key provider um, with the Drive of My Life program, and what was really encouraging uh, to me was MSD see that as well. But it's just, there's a, a gap coming from Wellington to our local communities that we've just got to wait patiently and it'll work, get worked out. So for us, definitely, they're in the equation and um, we've had been having discussions with them in MPI for, I don't know, it's probably about eight months now, but now there's some funding because that was part of the barrier and the next piece is actually the work that we're going to do with the schools and we have one school that has put their hand up and said that we're happy to pilot with you and so we will be part of that. Thanks, Mark. Um, no questions from me, but just look, congratulations on the work that you're doing. I, I see the results uh, and I hear the, the good comments coming back from, from employers of, of the, the process that you run and the relationships that uh, are built through that. So, um, great stuff. Well done. Thank you. Uh, Neville? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I just got a question uh, in regards to the driver licence. Is the percentage really high? Is it above 60, 70 percent of the group that have that come to you without without a license? You know, like. So, um, just to give you an indication, uh, at Gore High, when we serviced them last year, there was two people leaving <coughs> year 13 with a full license. So it's a really low number of young people that are leaving with full license, and then uh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head of what the restricted was. So unless you've got young people that are highly motivated and they know what career they're going to go into and they've got the avenue of good 
financial support because that's a barrier as well as the cost to these licenses. Yeah. So we so there's definitely a lot of work to do, and it's something that we've pushed just about in every government place that we can, um, because there has been young people that can't take jobs because they actually can't get to work. Yeah. Having access to a defensive driving course as well plays a big part in that. Um, if you undertake that, it reduces the time to get your full license by six months. And if a uh, school doesn't provide that course, then that has that overflow into when they're looking for work, they don't have that full license quite yet. Any um, no, yeah, Mr. Chair, the, I, the whole licensing thing is something I really struggle to get my head around. Um, there does seem to be much less um, urgency in, in younger people now to get their licences than there once was. I know in, in my um, situation, by the time I turned 15, um, the day I turned 15, I had the licence by 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and that was just my aim in life, was to get that licence. But it only happened because I had parents that were prepared to teach me to drive for two or three years before uh, I was 15. And just educating parents of the, of the role that a licence has in, in somebody's future is, um, is something that we should be looking at how we, how we can do that. But look, I understand parents are busy. You know, they, they get home at night and um, they've got a lot of things to do. So, yeah, there's a lot of pressure on families. No, thanks for that, Tracy. We won't um, ask what model of car you you driving, <laughs> Tristan. Why not? Was it a model A or a model T? <laughs> but um, actually, you pr it was a Prince. Do you know what a Prince was? A Prince? No. I'll tell you later. Thank you. But no, I think you you are right. There is um, there's, there's quite a, a uh, quite a rigmarole to go through. So, yeah. I was just going to say, Mr. Chairman, I'm very surprised at your uh, compassion and not digging deeper into the true motivations of uh, His Worship's parents for getting him as a licence at 15 years of age. <laughs> right, we'll move on from that valid point. Um, I just have a, uh, a, if there's no further discussion regarding that, uh, we just have someone to move that report's received. Uh, Glennis and uh, seconded by uh, Councillor Phillips, all those in favour? Okay, and now we link so nicely to the um, the uh, Gord uh, District Business Survey Report, and I think we have sort of Mark and obviously got Rebecca and Kent online. Hopefully. hopefully yep. Welcome. Yeah. Hopefully they can hear us. You hear? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Technology's working for us. So I'm not sure who wants to lead. Um, We've got to lead, yeah, lead it off. Go we'll get um, and lead this off, and then people contribute where mm. applicable. So um, you will have met Rebecca before because she has done some other pieces of work, and um, Kent was a significant help to us when we did the first scoping because he actually spoke to all of the businesses and we've just completed another 91 interviews. So I asked them to sit in today because I thought you might have some questions that's about um, their experiences. Uh, but the high level of this is the, the importance for us doing the scoping and closing the gaps is it gives us a really good insight into where businesses are at and also who actually has jobs out there that we can place people with. And that was one of the real successes with our first year of Closing the Gaps, because we really got a big head start. So that was part of doing this again, but we also wanted to understand how businesses were actually feeling at this point in time, since we've gone through COVID. So 18 months ago, um, we had a really positive response, and it's much more um, pessimistic I guess at this point in time, yeah. of how people are seeing the next six to 12 months. And we also included the agricultural sector in uh, this time. Uh, uh, um, uh, sure we might have someone on mute online. There might be a bit of sound coming through from somewhere. Yeah. Um, so, Probably the things that people are talking about is um, the things that are adversely affecting their businesses, supply chain, staffing, and the increase in fuel. 
So, um, Rebecca and Ken, is there any background that you've got? Because we've got... Maybe you can pop it on I wonder if Rebecca and Ken should log off and log on again. We just seem to be getting some um, feedback. Uh, we have, yeah, we've got some uh, echoing stuff coming through of um, yeah, people who um, people are laughing and yeah, we've, the background. We seem to be picking it up as well. We've got that happening too. <laughs> We're just trying to work out what that is. Wondering if they should try logging off and logging on again, see what happens. Council? That's, that's an open. Just be it, be it with us, Rebecca. Oh, sorry. Just be with us for a minute. We're just <laughs> checking the technology. Okay, we'll just have a test in. Can you hear us? Okay, um, so the ad adverse effects are really associated to uh, supply chain staffing and the increasing costs is what people were telling us. And um, the agricultural sector are really strong around they're struggling to retain staff and attract staff. Some of the contracting spaces are more positive because they're gonna be bringing in um, employees from overseas this year. There's definitely changes in workforce attitudes that we're picking up in our district. So there's higher rates of anxiety and wellness. Um, there's a lot more financial pressure and people are telling us that there's a change in work ethic as well. But on a more positive note, 41% uh, of businesses said that there was an increase, they're looking at ex potential expansion, uh, new products for their clients and new service offerings. Uh, I think it was, it's really recognised that there is still a need to be strengthening a business community through potential collaboration is what people have told us. And um, there, there's still that regulatory um, aspect is coming through that they're wanting ease of access or ease of process uh, around compliance in the regulatory space. So I'm going to leave it there and maybe if anybody's got any questions me or for no um, thanks Anne is is there anything that uh, you'd like to add there Rebecca or Kent around um, your information gathering process or um, add a wee bit to the commentary of Anne or would you rather us open it up to some discussion
you're just starting to fade a wee bit out there, Ken. Your microphone, have you, is it headphones or you're fading away? Yep, that's good. Yep, that's good. Okay, um, thanks for that, Kent. We'll, uh, we'll open it up to any queries or discussion from the floor. Um, probably the view you've given is not necessarily regional, but also national view as well. So um, I've identified some the decline in some of the uh, facilities or some of the businesses around town. And I think most of us would have realised that the foot traffic and there's a few more empty parks around town uh, in the last few months. So. Um, I'll open it up to the floor for any commentary or questions. Fairly self-explanatory, no one wants to... Uh, Dennis? Um, thank you, Mr Chair. I'm just wondering um, what you need about the business's thought to strengthen the community, that they should have more collaboration amongst the businesses. What does that actually mean? How, what do they feel needs to happen there? 
Kent, do you want to comment on well, that? So as you can hear that, you said it now, please. The businesses have said that they feel that, um, that they need to have more collaboration between the businesses. That's um, to strengthen the business community. So what does that actually mean? Yeah, I think, I think most of, of that was, was, was with regards to sort of having sort of one voice for their sectors um, and, and possibly uh, people sort of buying local and sort of supporting locally. Um, I, they, they, it sort of wasn't really elaborated on too much about that. <coughs> I guess from our perspective, um, the collaboration, like what we've just done with the farming community, there's been some good outcomes. Uh, some of the training opportunities we're gonna be, that are going to be coming through with Great South, the work we're doing with them, is actually getting people in the room and sharing some ideas and stimulating. And today, actually, I had a really good conversation uh, with Mary Ann Weber for the Food and Fibre and Bernadette Hunt around that, and they were really excited <laughs> about some collaborations that we're setting up in Gore. So I guess we just have to quietly keep working away at it. Mm. Uh, well, those are projects that we're working on with partners um, for Gore District. Yeah. Okay, any other commentary? Tracy? Um, well, thanks, Richard, and, and thank you, Kent and, and Rebecca, for the work that you've done here. And I guess you, you have identified you know, quite a number of real pinch points in, in our community and, and ones that we need to take very seriously. But there's no getting away from the fact that retail is hard work. It's been hard work for a long time, uh, and uh, there's a lot more competition than there ever, ever was. And I know in the past, um, the competition was the person beside you or the person on the other side of the street, but now the competition is the person on the other side of the world. And, and staying um, ahead of that challenge is, is, a, is a real challenge. Um, Go Retail was really an effort to, to try and combat that, and, and it had good points, and then it sort of tapered off a bit, uh, and it sounds like there's a, a will to, um, to look at reviving that. Uh, and look, I think if it's an opportunity for council to be some sort of facilitator there, then um, that's great. Uh, I think we should be right into that space. Uh, however, the council can't do it for everyone. There has to be a real willingness uh, from the majority of retailers to buy into something like that uh, for it to be successful. People want to come and, um, and shop in a, in a place where there is activity, where there's vibrancy, and, and Gore's got all the opportunities for that. Uh, it's just about pulling it together. And, and, and as I say, if, if council can be a conduit, fantastic. And I'd be all on for that. But, but re don't let me uh, underestimate the, 
what I said before, retailers hard work. Okay, uh, thank you, Worship. Um, yes. Yeah, I think uh, probably the, the, the detail there indicates where we are and we use that as a reference. Um, I do agree initiatives have to be driven you know, from community. Um, we can push it along, but we do need to have that um, to have that drive from the actual um, business community, particularly in that business environment there. Uh, and we are happy to assist and and look at the projects. Um, and I think Kirk Street, you know, we've we've discussed that in relation to some of our plans and um, some of the changes that were made there. And there were some real positives come out of that. Obviously, some negatives, but some real positives around business and um, usage of the street. So, uh, food for thought. Um, there's no more commentary there. Oh, no. Mr Chair, thank you. Sorry. Hi, Rebecca and Kent. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, some really encouraging figures around the potential gateway employers um, at 80% and uh, people who would consider hiring people with disabilities as well at 46%. That's really, really encouraging from a closing the gaps perspective because they would all meet funding criteria as well. So, very encouraging. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's good. But most people were very, were actually quite open at the, at the, at the sort of suit the health and safety of, of, of their business, and it was on obviously a very per, person basis. But most people have really good attitude. Good attitude is quite good. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, if there's no further discussion, I'll just seek someone to move that um, survey report is received. Uh, Councillor Grant and seconded. Uh, Councillor Reid, uh, all those in favour? Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Rebecca and Kent, and I believe you're going to be staying online for our next agenda. Yes, Rebecca. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca's. Yeah. Okay, no, thanks, guys. Thank you. And we on to item six, which is obviously uh, positioning of Gore. Um, there's been a lot of work through various um, groups and workshops, and um, both internally, externally, and um, around the area relating to the brown cow, uh, brown trout, brown cow. I was going to say brown, <laughs> brown trout capital of the world. <laughs> um, it's black and white cows, actually. But brown trout capital of the world and obviously looking um, at positioning of gore uh, in relation to that. So we've got some documentation there and obviously a report from our consultants um, relating to that. And are you going to lead the discussion there? Okay, so just some background. This is um, one of the first things that this committee asked for uh, when I turned up in this position. And um, we got a small group of uh, staff, so Sonia and myself, and um, Councillor McPhail and Councillor Dixon and Mia Tracy to try and work out how we might do this. And Great South um, came to the party as around, around funding this piece of work, which was fantastic. Uh, they definitely see the need uh, for us to understand the positioning as Gore as the brown trout capital of the world and the work that Rebecca did in some of the research clearly showed that there was a lot of articles even dating back to the 1970s. So I think the, the outcome of the report is very much, um, we are in a position to claim that, there is legitimacy around that. Uh, and in talking to Mark Frude, who's the new uh, GM for the tourism space at Great South, and Mark's been around the industry a long time uh, in the RTO space, but also working within New Zealand. And he was talking to me about the fact that Tourism New Zealand, their promotional strategy includes high end, and this market is definitely seen as high end, and he saw a real opportunity there for Gore if we can actually get the positioning right uh, at, to put ourselves out there. And I think also it was about the fact that we need to claim that positioning, because if we don't, we're going to lose it to someone else. So um, in the report there on page 54, it clearly outlines what the unique aspects uh, are that um, contribute to the positioning. And it also outlines the challenges that we're faced with and how do we actually navigate those into the future. 
So I'm going to just hand over to Rebecca, because um, Rebecca was the person that wrote this report, and alongside with Kent, who I think did some of the interviews. And we tried to give Rebecca a cross-section of the industry, so not just fishing guides, but people that we knew were fly fishermen or women that were in this district, but also did that worldwide and across New Zealand, because they were in one of the better positions to be able to say how we actually stack up as an experience. So um, we took quite a wide approach to it. So Rebecca, do you want to give a bit of an overview? Yes,
Okay, um, thanks Rebecca and um, Kent for that. Uh, is there any other commentary prior to opening it up? To... Okay, just um, be before we uh, I open it up for discussion, uh, obviously we've got a fairly good and uh, in-depth source document, document here for those I'm fairly sure um, some of us have seen it and been through it through the draft stages. A lot of information, a lot of contact, uh, content in it. Um, and it's probably been written through a time when we get to the point today where we look at it and we've got a global situation and an, and an economic situation which we see around town and various things changing. Um, the strategy that's indicated there is through, I believe, a five-year five -year life of the strategy. So the decisions or the, the projects we look at, uh, we are looking out at a, at a reasonably long window um, around working forward. Um, and it's tied to a number of other different factors, including river, river quality and, and um, you know, the, the basis of that. So um, I thank these guys for the content in the report. It's um, in depth. There's not much that hasn't been scratched at or evoked or um, brought to the surface. Uh, which is good, and uh, I now open it up to the councillors for discussion. I think we are looking at trying to um, go through uh, the actions required, and whether we agree or disagree, uh, the lists are quite comprehensive there on where we're trying to go forward on. So uh, I welcome the councillors' comments. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair, and thanks, Rebecca and uh, Kent. It certainly is a, a fulsome report and some fascinating stuff in there and some, some really big potential for, for this community uh, going forward. Um, just a couple of questions and, and, and I'm just not sure where this sits. Connection with the Runanga, I know we've had a Runanga person involved on the, on the project, but is that being considered by the Runanga, do we know? Um, I'm just, I'm interested, I know trout are not uh, natives at all, but um, I know that, that Hokanui have got a particular focus on the life in the river, and, and I'm just keen to get a sense of what their thoughts are on this whole process. Um, I think that the message through the process was that brown trout are not a native fish, yeah. so that's the first point for them. Um, the their big interest would be in the quality, water quality, a side of this project. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. It's a very comprehensive report. Thank you. There's actually quite a, th a bit there to digest. Um, I think we can only go forward with it and do the best that we can, but I do um, take your point about the comments about the loss of uh, the Mayfi rise, and I often wonder if that's not down to the loss of the willows, because I do know that Mayfi hatch in eddies and back, back parts of the river, and then they straight away head to the trees that used to be the willows, and the grasses on the riverbank to actually mate, because they have a very short lifespan. So, you know, what are we looking at on the river? Less willows. And Environment Southland saying that, um, you know, they're going to be looking at flood protection and they've the river has straightened, the water flows much more quickly on the whole, and there is no cover and no willow um, areas. And even if they were planted in groupings down the river, maybe that would help improve the quality because, um, while the water quality from nitrates and things is another story, um, they still have somewhere to breed, and as I say, they have a very short breeding cycle, so... I don't know how you change that, but I think it does need to be looked at. Uh, Glynis. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, just adding on to that, I know that fish really need shade, and so... Um, there's not a lot of shade left on the rivers either with the willows coming out, so that could be something that we can look at. I know there is a Matara water catchment group, Matara River water catchment group, um, and they're doing a lot of work doing some riparian plantings along the river, which might be quite, quite helpful. 
but I've really, um, yes, it is a great report, and I really support um, us moving on with this and promoting it because I think it is a position that Gore can take, and and um, it can add to a to a big bundle of things that Gore can do well. Yeah, yeah Mr. Chair, we have you know for a long time claimed the Brown Shell Capital of the World title. Um, and, and I guess if, if we're serious about that, then we need to put some you know, meat around the bones of what, what that looks like. I'm, I'm just not sure in my mind what the next steps are um, in terms of, and, and I'll be keen uh, from either uh, Rebecca or Kent or, or Anne, just what do you see as the obvious logical next steps for the council to take? And, yeah. and I'm also um, interested in uh, the, always interested in the dollars. Just wonder what the dollars are likely to look like by going down this track. Mm. Um, I, um, um, Annie, I had met her, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so um, I think, um, I mean, it is a comprehensive report. There are a lot of actions in there. Um, but I think to start off with, I think what you need to do is develop a brand. Um, and we're doing this with some other um, um, clients that we're working with. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Tracy. Just um, uh, obviously a couple of, couple of things that drop out of that is obviously in r relation to, because um, there is a, 11 key tasks there, and I think that it's, there's probably a phased, a, a couple of phases to, to that, uh, and whether there's any glaring ones in there that, and it's probably financial issues or, or a tag on some of those, which we would have to present th through to council anyway, any recommendation around that. Um, the, you know, whether it's worth discussing the, the, the building of a viewing platform or anything like that in this forum, or whether the concept goes through, uh, or is it part of a, a later stage phase, we um, take some of the low hanging fruit to start off. Uh, and I'd also be interested, obviously they've indicated in regard to the website, um, is that something that we need to be discussing with their, you know, with their specialist or comms, communication, marketing? Because um, there's a number of uh, tasks there, so I'd be interested to see whether there's any discussion on that. Uh, Neville, are you? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I've just got a, in um, one of those 11, those 11 key tasks, there's no, uh, nothing mentioned about uh, cooperation with the iwi or with the Matera um, liaison group. Um, they may have ideas that we probably that wouldn't may enhance the, the cooperation with them. 
So I think you know that should be one of the key tasks, and I, and I agree that um, the story of that of those eleven key, key tasks that should be as there is a five year strategic plan set aside that we set aside uh, small steps for us. And I, and I think I like the idea of uh, telling you a story within the trout the statue, uh, and that would be easily done. Our communications, um, I think that's also getting out there pretty quickly. So. I'd, I'd like to see that we have collaboration with our local iwi and also the liaison group. If I may um, just. just be able to help here, we are actually already working on an interpretation panel for the Trout Statue. That's a project we're doing in conjunction with the Gore Lions Club. Um, so that will be hopefully rolled out in time for their um, anniversary next year. Thanks for that, Sonia. Um, yeah, just in regard to obviously we partnership, um, the, we did with Jo have um, through the Renunga um, that she had gone through the drafts and has been party to, to the, the document that has been produced to, to to here today. But obviously that that partnership doesn't end at the production of this; it will continue on. So, but the Matara liaison definitely um, we have, we probably have had. Yeah, we'd have to review that. Uh, so there's obviously a recommendation at the end here in regard to are we uh, sort of heading towards that we endorse the, the whole project or um, is there anything in here that perhaps needs to be thinned out or taken out at this time? Or is it still open for discussion? Do we, uh, I think that's probably what the group's looking for. But would that be correct? Um, I think you have to keep in mind that this project can only go forward and be successful if it's resourced financially. And it, it's over five years. It's not something that's going to happen tomorrow, but actually it's the need to put the right things in place up front. And in talking with Great South, like Mark and I already have some of the contacts with fly fishing over 30 years, so there's some things that I can work with him to put in place straight away, but we don't have that robust repository of all of the information around this that a fly fishing audience across the world would be looking for. And I guess I'm, I'm definitely in the space that this should be an independent standalone website, and I, I would give you the example of Tussock Country. If we put all of that Tussock Country information into a Gore NZ, um, it actually would overwhelm all the other beautiful things that Gore has. So it's trying to find the balance in there, but if it's not resourced by council, that's not actually going to be a possibility. Uh, Dennis? Thanks, Mr Chair. Do we have any idea of the budget that we would need? I mean, I would, I would definitely support developing a brand and doing interpretation panels and a website in the start, just the beginning, and then have a strategic plan with a budget for the next five years um, worked out through the committee. Um, communications general manager? Um, for developing a brand, um, you're possibly looking at about $1,500, $2,000. A, a standalone website, um, probably between ten to fifteen thousand dollars. We are, I think, I think a digital presence is really important for, for our um, positioning, and we are in a, a really good place right now where we are revamping the Gore NZ website and having quite a lot of content developed and built in there around the brown trout fishing. So there'll be a number of um, pages which will be dedicated to that. Obviously, uh, begs the question that we aren't. Uh, are we doubling up on some of the? If, if there's already stuff in existence, that perhaps we should be making sure part of the phase with this is being collected into that, um, or into that process. Um, well, I've obviously got. Do you, you know, uh, Nick? Thanks, Mr. Chairperson. Just the other thing is, like, the water quality is massive for me. Like, the first thing you do is Google gore water quality. The first thing you come up, it says E. coli and unswimmable. 
So anyone who's going to look at that from overseas are going to go, well, why go fishing there when you can't, you can't eat it? You've got to release it if you do intend on doing that. So there's a lot of work to be done with water quality. I know a lot of anglers who fished the Matalda River now go further abroad because their waters are cleaner. Well, I guess from my perspective, we've got to secure the brown trout capital of the world brand. And to do that, we've got to develop a brand. Um, uh, and I'm just... I'm, I guess I'm just unclear in my own mind just what the, the physical steps are, um, not so much about developing the brand, but actually using that brand once we've, we've developed it. Um, but that doesn't have to happen overnight. Uh, it doesn't have to happen tonight, as long as we've got a clear intent that we want to be the brown trout capital of, of New Zealand and we want to take steps, or uh, brown trout capital of the world, and we want to take the, the appropriate steps to make that happen. In, uh, in the quickest way possible, in the most affordable way possible. Um, and, and I think that, well, yeah, no, that, I'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, so, uh, thank you, Tracy. Um, we've obviously, in agreement that there is, um, there is uh, a development project here that which we, yep. we will obviously go through the motion, but um, are we looking at whether we put this back to the community strategy group to give us the phases of, uh, like obviously support, um, or see if I've got a feeling that we, we endorse what we've got here, but we're looking at how a phased approach, plus we probably need some dollar value um, to either have it presented. Uh, yeah. Mr Chairman, if I can help the, <laughs> the meeting. Um, it strikes me that what you, the next phase of this is for, as you said, casting our net across the um, action plan and allocating some more detailed steps and some costings. But inevitably, this is going to come up against other visitor-related investments that the council's got to grapple with. And I'm referring to the likes of Tussock Country, which is supportive of the country music capital of New Zealand, and of course, our arts and heritage offering. So, and as elected members, you, you know that there's a finite um, pool of resource. So it may well be that the best approach would be for the staff to come back with a refined report with some suggestions, but bring that to the full council so all the members can then wrestle with how does this stack up against some of those other high priority areas that we have in that broader visitor attraction area. So, um Good, good point, Steve. I'm just not sure you're allowed to cast your net into the river to catch trout, but um, um, just wondering on um, timing on that, because we do need to make, you know, make haste, I think. Uh, Your Worship, you tell us when you want to see it, and we'll deliver it. Um, yeah, yesterday. Um, okay, well, yeah, obviously, um, Thank you, Steve, for that. With that phased approach, if we looked at getting a refined report to come back to full council as soon as possible, um, with indication on costing, but I think within the phased approach, and obviously we'll put it to the vote, that um, we have the um, steps, those initial steps that are gonna be carried out. Uh, we obviously are uh, looking at those 11 key tasks um, that are in there but the ones that actually need to be phased in around the commentary that we've received, um, establishing and retaining that brand and seeing how that, um, how that works or how that is established will probably have to be included in that, in that phased approach. Um, just looking at the recommendation there, that the report, the report we received, the committee endorsed the Brown Trout promotional strategy, which isn't, I'll put that to the vote, it's uh, indicating. Um, do we need to indicate which projects or projects we need any more project or projects? Or do we, what, do we actually ask for the phased report to include that for full council, that we've endorsed this report and then we're not removing anything from it at present and that will be put to full council for discussion? <clears throat> I'd anticipate when it comes to full council, it'll have that information you're talking about, Steve, and, and lining it up against some of the other 
big um, yeah. promotional things that are going on at the same time. Through, Mr. through you, Mr Chairman, yeah, that's correct. So I think the recommendation and the third prong of that would be not that you prioritise projects, unless you want to now, but that you uh, seek a further report to the full council by staff um, offering up a pathway of suggested action points and projects to complete with um, funding allocation suggestions and that this be placed in context with the council's current and proposed commitments to other visitor attraction um, sectors. We get all that recommendation. <laughs> um, yeah, because obviously we've, uh, we've we've got some tasks in there that haven't, like if we were going to investigate the opportunity to build a platform, there's obviously some substantial costings and and you know matters that would need to be discussed on that, and that would be fairly way down our phase, or if at all, would be part of that. But there's clearly some that would be well stacked up in the in the phase process. Would that be the expectations of the committee? Clearness. Thank you, Mr Chair. I don't see that this should become a choice between some of these other projects and this project. I see that it should be considered on its merit because it does bring in a lot of um, income into the town. I know these fishermen come in here and they do spend a lot of money and they do buy houses in town. So I don't see it to be a choice. I just think it needs to be looked at on its own merit. Uh, thank you, Glenis. Um, um, sorry. Uh, well, I, I think we don't have to change too much in the, re in the recommendation. And what the recommendation says that the committee endorsed the Brown Trout promotional strategy and that the committee, we just change and that staff indicate which projects or projects it would like to see to advanced in first order and resources and budget identified and developed. Bring that forward to council at the next meeting. Would that be an easy way around it? Yeah, Steve? Look, I just I perhaps have a slightly contrary view, um, and, and I disagree with, with Glenis in saying that this is not about making choices. Look, I think that, um, you know, for example, Tussock Country and the Trout um, Capital of the World program, uh, like, there's not a choice between one or the other. They're both going to happen. It's about the timing and just how mm. we progress those. And in my mind, anyway, there's both of them are well worth uh, the effort, and there'll be other projects that'll fit in there too, but we can't do everything at the same time. Uh, we've just got to make sure that we've got um, our you know, bases covered in doing the important thing, and certainly from my perspective, the important thing in this um, particular subject is about securing the brand. And, and then, we can use, then we can work out whatever platform that's going to be to promote that brand. Okay, thank you. Tracy, uh, so we've obviously got uh, the recommendation there. We, as the general feeling is that we endorse uh, the content of what's here. We're not going to separate um, anything out at present. It goes back to the, uh, obviously, staff, the committees um, indicated the content of the report um, stands and that they will come back to us with phase, uh, phase and budget and resources around um, the facilitation of um, early stage development, obviously in regard to brand and um, securing. So, um, I think we have that. And if someone would like to move that recommendation, uh, Neville, and seconded by Glenis. Um, all those in favour? All right. Thank you. Um, Can I just like to add? It's a great piece of work, and well done, everybody. Yeah, I think I think that goes uh, goes from everyone here to to Kent and Rebecca. There's a huge amount of effort's gone into that um, report, and as I've said previously, the standard of reports that we receive from the group is um, is always uh, of a high standard and plenty of content for us to examine. So thank you for that. Thank you, councillors. Uh, we'll move on to the. 
next item, uh, are these guys going to head away? Yeah. Thanks for joining the meeting. Uh, we are moving to just the transitions. Um, just transitions, we've got a um, report from Bobby Brown, and I think you're going to just talk us Thank you. Talk, talk us through, so um, Anne's going to take us through this. So on the agenda is the July report uh, from Just Transitions from Bobby Brown, and Bobby is the, the lead for this project. Um, I'm not going to go through the report in detail, but just to remind you that Just Transitions as a project lead is actually MB, and the purpose is for helping Southland build its economic and environmental and social resilience beyond um, the proposed closure of New Zealand's aluminium smelter, so TY. Uh, our council actually has a significant, put a significant amount of time into this uh, just transition process, because there are 16 work streams. And Mayor Tra Tracy is the chair of the oversight and our chief executive is the chair of the um, housing uh, work stream. Yeah, just just a small correction. I'm not the chair. I'm a member of the oh, right. of the oversight committee. Yeah. So he has a good understanding of what's happening at that level. And um, there's other other work streams beyond 2025. So uh, that is very much around the redevelopment of the destination management strategy that was put in place three years ago, but with the change of environment um, that's been reviewed. So I am sitting on that oversight group and also attending all of those workshops in developing up that destination management strategy. So if you have any questions, maybe between the Chief Executive, Tracy and myself, we may be able to answer them. Thanks for that, Anne. Um, I've obviously been party to some of the briefings from um, Bobby anyway, so, and I think uh, our Worship was there. Um, I'll open it up to the floor to ask any questions in relation to the content of that. Uh, Dennis? Thank you, Mr Chair. I just have one question. Um, the smelter has changed its plan, I, I believe, and it's now going to remain open. Um, it's not going to affect this in any way. We'll still continue with this transition. Yeah, so the, the, work, the work process is still going to continue through, and there's been reassurance that that will complete the process. Some work streams are in a phase that they're completing their strategy and it's going to Wellington for consideration, which fills into the next budget round. Other pieces of work are just in the starting phase. So th if all the streams are at different stages. Certainly, <coughs> certainly the, um, the situation with the smelter uh, is, it, it, it's changed from two years ago when the announcement was made, um, but it's still pretty fluid. and. There's a whole lot of other options um, that are sort of coming in from left field in terms of you know what can be uh, what what the electricity can be used for and, and just how much electricity is required and whatever. So, so there's a there's a whole lot of options with regard to the to this to the smelter. With you know all that beside, there's a huge job to be done um, by Rio in terms of remediation uh, and you know, from all. Everything that I read, they're getting on and doing that, but it's um, it's not something that's going to happen in the year, or two years. It's it's quite a long process, um, so there's going to be some uncertainty for for quite some time, I think. Um, and certainly, the just transition process is uh, one that's been set up. We're only the second uh, just transition process ever to be uh, assembled in New Zealand. The first one was in Taranaki, and and it's still working through a, a whole lot of a lot of challenges on it on its own, um, but from a local government perspective, that developing the beyond 2025 um, program has probably been the biggest focus for for local government. Um, we're, of course, we're involved in a whole lot of other bits and pieces, but but just the work that Bobby's pulling together is um, is, is substantial, uh, and it is. 
is going to give us a really good platform, I think, to, um, to spring forward. Thanks for that, um, Tracy. Uh, any other questions, discussion in regard to the document? Obviously, there's um, a lot of a lot of it's in the. Uh, I know Workstream wise is reliance. It is reliant on other work streams to be completed, so that they can move forward. And I think this is in here. It indicates. I'm just trying to remember how many 16 different work streams. And I think we're in number six at the moment. Seven. Seven of the 16 work, work streams. Um, don't have set deliverables or approaches as yet, so um, you know there's obviously a lot of work still to still to go on um, through that and through to 2025. So, but um, if there's no other discussion, or uh, if I could just have someone move that that uh, the report is received, uh, Councillor Grant and seconded, Councillor Reid. Thank you. Um, and now we move on to uh, sorry, all in, all those in favour. Thank you. Um, we move on to our community strategy progress to date presentation, which um, our community strategy manager and will be um, running us through. So I think you've got PowerPoint. Then. So community strategy update, um, I might just pass these round because you remember the document. So the, this document came from a strategy for growth, which we went through a process and finalised at the end of last year. You established the community strategy position It'll be two years ago in November. Kylie came into the team one year ago and Mark came around the same time um, in November but doing the Youth Council and uh, the Wealth and Community Space and then moved into Closing the Gaps. So the team's actually two full-time equivalent people even though there's three of us. So I just wanted to give you an update where we're at with the Gore District identity work. You'll remember that um, we had a half day workshop. We developed up all of this information, the social image, the personality, the icons. Um, a lot of that work, it's been put on hold, partly uh, after in discussion with Steve, we talked about the fact that Maruawa is coming and it's got a lot of the stories. So we don't want to duplicate, um, we want to use the resources of what is actually already happening in the organisation. And then working with Sonia um, and Caitlin on their work that they're doing with the website, we've taken across some of those stories we defined that day. So you'll start to see a shift in lining up to what we agreed on when we had that workshop. So these were three um, key components. And brand kit, you may remember we talked about that day that there was a really need for brand kit, which actually puts all of your images and IPs in one place. So Sonia and I've worked on that and it's up and established. And when the website goes live, that will be available um, more for the public. So uh, we've also done three days of photo shoot. Now, part of that was initiated through our Closing the Gaps work because we needed uh, images of young people and you'll see some of those images starting to come through in the website material but we also had Chris McLennan who's world renowned but is originally from Gore came here and he did that three days for us and we took him to a lot of locations that are not what I'd call standard places that people in Gore actually think about and he was blown away by some of those even though he knew the district so at some point we would like to get him back again to do more of um, just basically presenting us in a different way, in a different light. Sonia, do you want to give an update on the our website? Um, no, you're doing a good job, but just um, if anyone wanted to have a look at the brand kit, 
it is live, and we just haven't publicised it, as Ian said, until we do go live, but it's just images.goreanz.com. So you're more than welcome to jump on there and have a look. Thanks, Sonia. So the sector plans, which is on the document there, the welcome plan you've um, seen and approved and implementation is underway, and actually just today, uh, Mark and I received all the design material, so it gives us a professional look like we have for Ready for Living and Closing the Gaps which is very cool, so that will be the image and the look and feel going forward. So we're in the phase of developing the welcome plan and the intention is that, like, sorry, the welcome pack and the intention is that will be rolled out in September. We actually have a working group of community people that have come together and they've done quite a bit of that work, which I was incredibly grateful because Mark has been out of the equation for the last six to eight weeks. And... Um, with their help and, and then Mark picking it up again this week. We're almost there, aren't we? Which is really awesome. The event plan was done over a year ago and um, Sonia and I had a discussion about it because there was the intention to report back now, but actually it didn't make sense to do that because of the COVID environment. And a lot of things haven't been able to happen um, because of COVID in this space. So next year you will get a report back on that. Trails feasibility was done some time ago. I think it was like maybe 2017, does that sound right, Steve? It's, it's more than five years. And bits and pieces of that trails feasibility have been picked up by the trails group that exists in Gore. <coughs> Ready for living. The, we're making huge progress here um, with the strategy document for Ready for Living. And our intention is to actually start the review process in November. Um, we had a really positive meeting with the working group a couple of weeks ago and we went through and the, probably the most, the biggest outstanding issue is really around, um, I suppose you could call it the housing space of elderly people and how could we do that differently in Gore. And I guess because the environment is shifting so much, there's now a gap in the market between people being in their house to going to rest home care. And so if you went back five plus years, people would have been moving to a rest home care and they would still be a lot more able than they potentially are now. But people are still looking for some space that actually doesn't exist here at the moment. So there's a lot of um, a conversation I had with Sharon Adler. Um, she had actually was, has been to Europe and she will come and talk to us at some point about this, but was looking at really innovative spaces. And she also talked about different parts of New Zealand that are picking up pieces within that. So we're probably just going to park that as we move into the review of the strategy and there will be something that we'll then have to have some focus. Uh, labour force, we're currently working on this piece of work right now. So the, the latest discussions of not with 91 businesses and the report you received today helps to inform that piece of work. But in Southland at the moment, you've got the regional labour force group, you've got a work stream and just transitions, and you've got ourselves with closing the gaps, you've got Hokanui Punui doing some, some pieces, you've got the Ranunga doing some pieces. Um, I'm sure I'm missing one or two. <laughs> so Mark and I have been trying to coordinate um, the conversation with all of those people to get a position of where is Gore at and what are the real things that we need on the ground here. So that piece of work hopefully will come to you at the next committee meeting. Youth Council, Mark, do you want to comment? Yes, uh, if I can wait. <laughs> uh, I'll wait for um, so in terms of uh, building leadership, Yes, this is a new development this year. Um, so um, Nick and myself have worked with the council to establish groups that oversee events, uh, communications and projects. And that gives them that sense or that increased sense of responsibility in making things happen for, in the community. And we've also had a number of guest speakers uh, come on a regular basis to share their knowledge and skills with the youth councillors as well. And that's been really well received, including the mayor himself. Um, and fundraising, uh, we've recently raised $200 for Pink Shirt Day um, in support of mental health awareness and that involved the uh, members undertaking dares um, from ice baths to um, ice bucket challenges to 
spicy, nasty food um, eating competitions <laughs> to uh, just wearing their pyjamas to school as well. So um, fair play to them, they did really well. Uh, yes, coming up. Um, so big news, uh, we'll be having the first Youth Awards for a couple of years on the 10th of December this year. And we're hoping that uh, Hayden Jones will be able to come along and be the guest speaker at that event. There's going to be a country theme. Um, we're in, uh, encouraging people to come along dressed accordingly as well and have a bit of fun on the night with it. Um, the skate park redevelopment, um, we're hoping, is going to go ahead in the next three to four months. We've been in discussion with Keith McRobbie, the Parks and Rec Manager, to, um, through the Youth Council to improve what we currently have at the skate park in terms of fencing. Uh, there's discussion around a, a climbing wall, um, although that hasn't been confirmed yet. And uh, that will vastly improve that um, space for youth. Um, the Frisbee Golf Course as well. We, again, we're in discussion with Keith and a number of other stakeholders in the area, some who were involved with the Dollamore Park Frisbee, um, Frisbee Golf Course. And uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm there to set something up in Hamilton Park um, as a more accessible course for families to go along and have a bit of fun with their children. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Gore data set. You know, we've had some initial conversations with Great South about this, but I've put that discussion on hold because within some of the work streams and just transitions, data sets is coming up. So we want to see what the outcome of that is first before we look to progress this. Um, <laughs> on the document you'll see there, these are all sectors that we said we would liaise with, and um, you had suggested probably the, uh, the one um, my t this t our team, community strategy, hasn't really touched base with would be water. All of the others we've definitely having conversations with. The intention is that there would be some workshops with in the sectors when we look to redevelop the community uh, strategy going forward. So Thriving Southland have regular liaison. Um, met with Sharon, Sandra, sorry, this week, and she told me that there's three more groups in Gore District being established and catchment groups, and there will be another coordinator coming on into our district for those three. Uh, we're working on a couple of projects together with Mary Ann Weber that are in the food and fibre sector to see what we can get going. Um, Sandra's actually a real key for us because when we're trying to connect with the right people in the rural community, she actually knows a lot of them. and and we can ask her different things and she'll connect me up with people that are interested in a subject, um, et cetera. So really valuable and been really helpful for us to get the courses out into the rural sector. So pretty grateful for her um, input. Regularly catching up with Hokanui Rananga, um, jo, particularly Joe, and Joe is sitting on several of our groups, but um, Mark's worked a lot with Ricky and then also with Matu. So um, I think, you know, there's not many weeks go by when we're not talking to them. In this area, the community hub, the feasibility is underway. So this is the CNT building and the potential relocation of that. But it's interesting in the health locality space, there needs to be a conversation just about what that might look like and what the needs in that hub. So hoping to connect that up very shortly. Steve, I don't know, do you want to comment on any of the others here? Um, the town and country one, that's really just been liaison because they're looking to actually redevelop that and looking to obtain some funding because that's a significant asset in our event space at the moment. Uh, Thanks, Steve. Safe in the South, all of these things um, have been coming up in our age-friendly discussion and also in the work with neighbourhood support. Um, loneliness definitely has got more on our radar since COVID and people 
you know, being in the home environment and not venturing out so much, and elder abuse. We did try to apply for some government funding for elder abuse, but weren't successful. But through that, we have um, established some quite strong connections with different government agencies in Wellington, so we sort of, we will pursue that. Neighbourhood support, we're working with it. I already mentioned today how often this is actually sits within the council environment. Um, CNT is the lead on this and are working closely with um, ourselves and also police. So these are only a few of the points that I've put in here. But they're starting to make inroads and we've been having discussions about how do we get neighbour support into the rural community. Health, the big one on there is the locality networks. You know, I've only really just joined that conversation in the last two weeks. I had a few hours in Dunedin with Well South and Stuart Barson, who is leading that coordination um, for the Hokanui locality network. So, yeah, that's probably the big one in, in that space. And, of course, there is a lot of liaison that Kylie's doing as well for um, in the aged space. All of these we have strong relationships with now. Um, when we started, we couldn't have said that. So those relationships are either held by Kylie or Mark or myself. Education, the main areas we're working closely is REAP, SIT and secondary. We haven't done so much in the primary or early childhood. International students, we've had discussions with both our high schools here uh, about uh, the COVID environment and how we move out of that um, and into attracting students. And I know that discussion, when I met with SIT uh, yesterday, the international students came up as well. Community directory. So this is a piece of work that's been done by um, the CNT team with Kelly Young leading. So they are slowly building this directory which is online. Um, which has actually been really, really needed um, in our community. So the focus of it is on co the community providers. Hokanui Hunui, the evaluation report has been completed and the Hunui will be presenting that to stakeholders in September. Um, Mark and I and Kylie are regularly in liaison with Lisa and, d and we do actually sit on one or two groups together. Ready for living, I don't think there's anything on there that you don't know about. Um, probably the one that I would say is the strengthening program that Kylie runs has been really successful and there is demand for us to put two more of those in place. But that is actually a really real big challenge for us because <coughs> we've got other priorities, I guess. So we're really looking to see if there's another way of doing it. Can we get someone else to take them? Um, where could those courses actually be held? And to date, we haven't actually been able to resolve that. But it's definitely on our radar. So the future um, focus is really going to be getting funding again, because Kylie's position is funded through to the end of June, and we really need that to continue, because we've made huge inroads in the last 12 months. Uh, so we will be pitching to PH Vickery Trust again, we, we do a six monthly report, Kylie and I, and our intention is to go to Christchurch and catch up with them. They're really happy with the relationship with council. Uh, it's just, how, do, how does that look? So I don't, don't want us to be in the position that um, we don't know whether we've got funding and we, we lose Kylie because of that. So we're going to start that process before Christmas. Kylie's just started the age-friendly business. Um, 15, was it, Kylie, businesses this last week that you've been to? And the Mayor had asked us uh, that we make sure our own organisation and our teams are age-friendly. So she's doing a round of meetings with the individual teams at the moment and working through that process. So our intention is to review, start the process of reviewing the strategy. We're looking to start with some workshops. We're just still discussing what the best process will be. We're thinking because we actually... When the strategy was done a few years ago as a pilot, it was probably more driven by agency, and we're wanting to actually hear from the community this time. Uh, so we intend to do some smaller meetings and then take the information to the agencies to test it. 
Youth Hub, uh, the Youth Hub came onto the strategy document from the growth strategy. We have a question whether that's actually needed um, in Gore because there are two or three providers that are actually doing a lot of good work. And the piece that seems to be missing when we talk to people who are working in the space is there doesn't seem to be a collaborative meeting, which was a bit like when we started in the workforce space and um, people didn't actually get together to understand whatever each other are doing. So that's where we're, we're going to start, um, just to try and get an understanding of what's actually needed. So these were the housing things that were on there. Um, an update from Kayanga Aura is they've just I met with them on Friday in Dunedin. They've got a plan. They are just assessing the various mix of housing. So whether it's one bedroom, two bedroom, four bedroom, six bedroom. Uh, it looks like 19 um, properties at the moment. Uh, they said that the next thing that we will see is demolition on site. Steve, do you want to comment because you're the chair of housing? Do you want to put these slides down? Yeah, I'm, as uh, Anne said, I'm chair of a housing forum um, group which uh, is part of the Just Transitions. Um, and it's quite interesting that uh, this council is quite hands-on with housing um, through our Matt Ridge Joint um, Venture Development compared to other councils where um, there has been pretty much left to the marketplace, I suppose. Uh, but Invercargill are heavily uh, invested in trying to work out what its housing needs are. Um, and so hence, we've actually commissioned a body of work about looking at what are the Southland housing needs uh, in the region uh, and there are uh, requests for specific um, data to be produced coming from Invercargill and Southland, less so from us but we're very still invested in the, the, the project um, and that is hoped to then give us a good platform to work from and I'm certainly keen as chair to see that we get a pilot project out of this too because I think housing is the way we provide housing traditionally, the needs of different members of the community um, differ and I think the, um, the barriers to accessing quality housing are such that it demands probably a, a fresh approach so we're hopeful that we can develop a pilot project too by the end of their time of actually submitting a report so that uh, it, it can be a live example. Um, and there's been some good examples already given, particularly we had a presentation from Fiordland uh, where there's been um, some quite unique approaches taken to how, you, for example, you treat land in a project and take some of the high cost out of that. Um, so that's a bit of a, a, sort of a quick fire summary of where we are. Sonia's team are doing a great job of that. Marketing plan. Um, we talked about a marketing plan, but because of the identity work, and these areas still need to be further developed from a product perspective before we do that marketing work. And also, that is a resourcing issue as well. Maruai, I think you're all up to speed with what's happening there, and I believe there's a report coming. Yes, Mirawai, uh, the tenders are being solicited as we speak and it's hoped that a report on those tenders will be submitted to the Council um, late uh, in September, very early October. Thanks, Steve. A labour force, I don't think I need to go over this because I think we've pretty much covered it all off, but we've signed the contract, the next step is to actually um, get the person in place again for, which is a fixed term contract through to end of June next year. Um, Regional Business Partner Network is a program that's run through Great South and Ben Lewis heads that. So Mark and I work regularly with Ben on what needs to come to Gore and they actually come into the offices here to meet with businesses. Um, I think we've, had, we've discussed with them about some of the challenges of regional business because it's Partners Network because there's a lot of things on offer and if 
we really need to break it down because otherwise it's quite confusing of how people engage with it. But that will continue on in the next over the next year. Um, Coin the same thing. They are coming to Gore. Um, they have an interesting program that's just started in Invercargill called Make It, and so it's really business business people or individuals that have ideas about a product, and we're looking at the possibility that that Make It course could be run out of SIT um, next year here in Gore, which would be awesome because there's quite a few people that would be interested in that. Chamber, um, Mark and I try and get along to the chamber meetings when they're in Gore. Just you know, it helps with the liaison, but also. They've been involved in the Newcomers Leadership Program and we did have some issues trying to get funding for that, so they've picked up a mantle because we needed a central organisation for all of Southland. Doing it as individual councils wasn't working. Um, in the business networking space, we have a business Facebook page which we're really using just to push out the events that are happening. Um, and I guess one of the things that we're wanting to do is establish a newsletter to all the people that are now on our database to keep them informed of the things that are available and coming, because that seems to be the challenge for us, is actually getting all that information out to people. Trout project we've talked about today. Digital connectivity, there is a piece of work that's been done and commissioned through Great South, and we're expecting to receive that piece of work shortly. We've sort of covered off just transitions. Immigration, Mark is the person that tends to liaise on the immigration front. There was quite a bit of work in this space when we were in COVID and when there was a lot of uncertainty for our migrant community. So Mark's role is actually connecting people to the right people. So we're looking to revise the strategy. We're looking that maybe it's five uh, workshops um, in their communities, and then that list of sectors, and that list of sectors is probably not complete, which would also inform the community outcomes for the LTP, the long-term plan. We would propose to start this work early next year and through to June. Um, I guess the thing I'm really conscious of is we don't want to be going to the community endlessly because then they get fatigue of consultation and conversation and I'm also very aware there's other things going on with other agencies. So we are in discussion with some of those other agencies if they're going to be going to the community where are the opportunities for us to work together to get because we're all looking for similar types of information. So um, that's a bit of a work in progress for going forward. So that's it. Got any questions? It's not a question, it's just a comment. Do you, Kylie, Mark, and who did I say, Sonia, do you, do you ever get time to sleep? It's a really, it's a lot of work and it's a really good direction for us to be going in. I'm, it's, it's quite impressive. Yeah. So thank you for your work, for your leadership in all this area, Anne, and for Mark and Kylie and Sonia. And just a comment, uh, Mark, great work with the Youth Council in conjunction with Nick. I like that leadership thing. That's great. Um, and Sonia, the Friday thing that you're doing on Facebook, so many of my friends have commented and um, they just love seeing the old photos and, you know, yada, yada, yada. It's a long conversation. But thank you all. It's good work. Thank you, Councillor Reid. Um, I would also just like to thank Councillor Grant because without you, Nick, I would have been sunk in the last two months. And I really, really appreciated you putting your hand up and sending me an email saying, I can pick up Youth Council. So thank you so much for that because it meant we didn't lose any momentum. And um, having Mark giving us some direction from a distance was also good. So we're actually in a really good place because I was worried we were not going to be. So we couldn't have done that without you. Thank you. Lovely. Any uh, other questions for Anne or progress? Um, it is a busy, busy platform and a busy place. Um, when you actually see it all laid out like that, you realise the amount of amount of input and um, networking and engagement and projects that are flowing through the the community strategies uh, office. And I am aware of that from some of my in-depth discussions with Anne. 
at various times, but um, I think it's a good report and it's good to keep us updated. Um, some of them are quite open-ended projects too that go on for a long time and you can't get that closure and just produce the, the result all, all in one, one hit. Um, they're, you know, they're quite fluid and they um, change direction at certain stages and um, you know, the natural conclusion uh, cannot be evident sometimes. But uh, thanks to the work from the team. Um, just someone like to recommend that that report is received. Uh, Councillor Reid and seconded uh, Councillor Dixon and um, all in favour. Um, and once again, thanks. Um, that's the end of the agenda, unless there's anything else that's in there that wishes to be discussed. Um, thank you, councillors, for your time today. We've obviously had quite a, a long day. Uh, appreciate it. We've gone through a number of different things, but um, if there's nothing else, I'll uh, close the meeting at that stage. Thank you.